to this week's guest in a minute. But first, join our community by hitting the subscribe button and the bell so as soon as we post a new guest, you get it right away. And don't forget to hit the like and share buttons because that helps us grow the show. So welcome. Hit the subscribe button and let's get to this week's guest. Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm Gino Retta. You know, I've spent over four decades working in the game, fortunate enough to meet some of the great legends of the game, saw them come into the game, watch them shine, and now they've moved on to life after the game. The 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast gives us a chance to catch up, tell some great stories, relive some great memories, and hear what they're up to today. On today's show, a Stanley Cup champion who played 16 years in the NHL, all of them with the Boston Bruins, ninth all-time for points with the organization. He was also a key member of the Czech national team for multiple World Junior, two Winter Olympic Games, two bronze medals of the World Championships. Stanley Cup champion, Bruins legend David Krejci joins us. David, welcome, my friend. Great to catch up with you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. The last time you and I were on the ice together was 2011 in Vancouver when you were celebrating the Stanley Cup. That was uh, a night, obviously, that stands out in your memory. What was it like for you on that night in particular, parading the Stanley Cup around the ice? Yeah, that's that's a great memory. So I got a bunch of pictures um, around my office, but but at the same time, I was I was still young. I was still early in my career. I think that was my fourth year, so um, it was just I, I just couldn't believe. Uh, what we've achieved. It was just kind of one of those surreal moments that uh, it hits you um, months later. Um, but at the same time, we just, we just enjoyed it. We, we drank some beers. We, we party like we were supposed to. And, uh, but like I said, I, I didn't really appreciate it um, until a few months uh, went by. Do you remember, I mean, I don't know how much you guys were involved in this because there was a lot of celebrations for you guys. We stayed there doing the post game and, you know, did interviews with you guys on the ice and stuff. So we were there for quite a while. And then we tried to leave the building and the police wouldn't let us leave because of the riots that were going on in the streets of Vancouver because Canuck fans were not happy. By the time you got out of the building, was that all dissipated or did you have to go through that as well on your way out? Uh, if I remember correctly, I think somebody mentioned that there's some uh, there's some riots going on outside, uh, but at the same time we knew we're gonna we're gonna play some music, drink some beers. We brought all the family members uh, to the dressing room, so, so I think we stayed. I don't know uh, at least a couple hours after the game, just celebrating, and and uh, so by the time we left, um, if I remember correctly, I think it was all all clear, and. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. Maybe we had a police escort. I don't know. That was a long time ago. But I know people talk about it. There's things going on in the streets. But once we got out, um, it wasn't so bad. The really great memory for you through all that. I mean, let's face it. Tim Thomas won the Conn Smythe that year. He was spectacular. Um, he had one of the great all-time goaltending performances uh, in Stanley Cup playoff history. What do you remember of what Tim Thomas was able to do on that playoff run for you guys? He was one of those goalies that uh, such a unique style. Um, I'm sure a lot of goalies can talk about it, but um, he just stopped things that um, he wasn't supposed to stop. And he had a great attitude about it. Um, he was a, he was a great guy to get along in the dressing room. Um, and, but he he was different, just like just like most of the goalies are. But for some reason, that that was his year. That was his cup run, and we were lucky enough to have him. Now the Bruins were lucky to have you. If not for Tim Thomas, you win the Conn Smythe that year because you were. You, I mean, you had four game-winning goals during the playoffs that year. Um, I think you had twenty-three points in the twenty-five games, and you were still just a kid. Were Were there times where you wanted to pinch yourself and say, "I can't believe this is really happening in my life right now"? Yeah, that's kind of going back to the first question. It was all kind of surreal. Uh... Being up there in in the points leader in the playoffs and, and winning the cup, uh, game seven in Vancouver, it was just, uh, yeah, somebody pinched me. This this can this can be happening right now. But again, I don't I don't I don't think I was a, I don't think I would be MVP even even if Timmy wouldn't win it. Um, just because I don't think I was the player back then that I became. Um, I was I was lucky enough to play with some good players. I had great line mates. I had I had uh, Nathan and Milan. So that was. Uh, 
they had my back. What I, I nobody touched me. I could have done whatever I wanted. Nobody touched me because because those those two guys were were animals and and uh, great hockey players too. So we we got along great on and off the ice. But again, I don't think I was I was the player um, I became. Um, I was just um, I was just this young um, guy trying to make an impact and uh on that Stanley Cup run it worked but um I felt like I was much much more a uh, complete player um maybe 2013 when we lost to Chicago and 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 from um from there I was I I really liked my game after that you mentioned Nathan and Milan of course you're talking about Nathan Horton and Milan Lucic um there were some pretty spectacular moments um one of the moments that stands out to my mind was before you even reached the cup final it was Probably the most famous pass in Boston. There have been bigger goals, but in terms of passes, one of the most famous passes in Boston Bruins playoff history, your little saucer pass to Nathan Horton in a 0-0 game against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Your game seven, winner goes on to the cup final, and you make this pass right up. Basically, all Nathan Horton do is just leave his stick there, and it just touched the stick and went in the net. You guys end up winning the game one nothing. You're on the way to the Cup final. What's your memory of that pass of that moment? Yeah, just uh, game seven uh, going to the Stanley Cup final. That was uh, uh, yeah. A lot of people keep talking about um, that pass. And again, back then it it was just a pass. We won the game. We moved on. Um, but later on, years later, people people you know, see me on the street or or my teammates left me some messages after I retired last year. And they said one of my favorite memories, especially the guys from uh, Boston, um, it, it was that game seven uh, against Tampa, that that uh, winning pass. So those are kind of things that are hitting me later on now. Um, so, yeah. You get, I, and plus... You're you're living. You and I were just talking before we we began recording here. You're living in. Explain this to your audience. You're now living in South Carolina. How did that come to be, and what are you doing right now? <laughs> so yeah, it's a little, it, it's yeah. I know it's weird. I'm from Czech Republic. Uh, <laughs> I play in Boston for 16 years, and I live in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, just outside Charleston. Uh, my wife, she's from. She grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and then her family moved up. To Charleston, and then when we start dating, um, you know, we came down here a bunch of times, and uh, and uh, I'm a golfer. I like to play tennis, and this is just kind of great for both. We bought we bought it about ten years ago. The house, uh, spent summers a year train here, um, and now now we're pretty happy. We got we got two little kids. They go to school, so um, it's been pretty good so far. Your roots, your heart, obviously, still very much in the Czech. Uh with your Czech background, you had an opportunity. You grew up idolizing, and we'll talk about this a little later, idolizing Czechs who came before you. You would then end up becoming the idol for Czechs who followed behind you, including David Pasternak. You had a very special relationship with him. I'll talk about him. But what was it like for you when you got to take the Stanley Cup home to the Czech Republic at that point? Yeah, that was amazing. We uh, usually have a one day with the cup, and I had another Czech guy on the team, uh, Tomasz Kabrule. He yep. lives about uh, three hours from my hometown, but he had it first, so we showed up to his um, his place, um, spent a day with him and his family and his his city. Then the next day, we drove back to my city, and and uh, my town's pretty small. We got about fifteen thousand people, and um, I don't know more than five thousand people showed up to. I, I brought it to our little town square about 5,000 plus people showed up and it was pouring rain too everybody had umbrella but they still showed up and and because of they showed up so we stayed we stayed uh much hours later than than we were planning on just to make sure everybody gets a picture and and if they want to sign something so um that was pretty special then we brought it back to my parents house and we had a big party um and yeah by the time 11 or 12 o'clock hit I think you got a cup till like one, two or three a.m. I don't remember that, but I remember I was telling the guys like, "You guys can take the cup," uh, uh, because as a you know, it's awesome to have it, but you want to also have a good time with your buddies and every everyone. But people just coming and want to take a picture, and and you don't really get to enjoy it as much celebration with your friends and your family. So around I think eleven o'clock or something, I told them um, they can 
put it on the car and drive it, I think, to Zdenachar to Slovakia after after my day. It, it was amazing what you were able to accomplish. It's amazing from, you know, the town you came of 15,000 people and what you were able to accomplish. Um, in terms of highest scoring checks of all time, Yarmar Yager, Patrick Eliash, Jacob Voracek, Milan Hayduk, and yourself. What's it feel like to be that huge a part of Czech hockey history? Yeah, I don't know. Those are those are kind of tough questions because none of it really sunk in yet. I just retired retired past summer and, and I kind of stay away from hockey um pretty much this whole season. Um, so I don't, I don't really talk to many people about hockey. Um, don't do much interviews and stuff. So it's, um, it is what it is. Uh, I, I feel like I'm not ready to get back to that hockey world, uh, yet. Um, not, not re ready to talk about my achievements, I guess just yet. So, um, I'm just kind of taking my time and then when I'll be ready, then, uh, uh, who knows, maybe check, uh, Czech team uh, is going to do something for me. Who knows? Um, um, but for right now, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at, at home with the kids and, and the family. So playing some golf and tennis. So uh, I've been pretty happy right now. I find it interesting talking to you, David, because, I, I, you know, um, for the hockey fans who don't know, you didn't really want to retire. You got, you know, you got put into it because of some, some injury problems with your back. You're still very young. You're still in great shape. Um, you, you actually had a couple of retirements because you retired from the NHL a couple of years ago because you wanted to go back home and play in Czech, uh, to, to play in front of family and friends. That was very important to you. And then after taking a year and doing that, you came back to the NHL. Talk to, talk to me about the importance of going back home and playing a year of hockey back home while you could still play the game at the level you were able to, why was that so important to you? Yeah, the decision uh, was made a long time ago when I was a kid. That was that was a town where I grew up playing hockey, about ten minutes from my town. That's where I went to school, um, play hockey, and 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 watch watch the the men's team play. And that that was my goal. Um, I have so many friends there, so many memories. So I I always knew I want to come back at one point. And and just kind of my contract expired. Um, I think I was about 34, 35 at the time. Uh, it just kind of, and I was, I, I already had some injuries. I had, uh, I had to, uh, board my hips, um, hips done, uh, before. So I'm like, I, I don't have much left. Um, and I want to go back when I, I feel I'm, I can still make an impact on, on the game. So that's why I decided to go back and, and, uh, I, I had a boss. It was, um, it was amazing being, playing with some of my old friends and, and in front of my uh, family, all my family is still are still back there. So that was pretty special. But then you decided you weren't done yet. You decided you wanted to come back to the NHL and you, you signed. Obviously, you were going to be with the Bruins because you were a Bruin from the start and you wanted to finish right. that well. And it wasn't about the money for you because you signed for barely over the league minimum, then plus some bonuses. Why was it so important for you to make that comeback in the NHL even though that it, you know, you weren't a hundred percent physically well, but you came back and and part of an incredible historic run by the Boston Bruins organization. What made you wanted to come back for that one more year? Yeah, I kind of started maybe halfway through the season when I was um, back in Czech. Um, I I was I was playing really good hockey, uh, played really well. Um, uh, then NHL players couldn't go to Olympics that year, but uh, I was able to go because I was playing uh, back in Europe. Um, I played, I, I felt I played really well there. Um, then world championship, I felt like I, I, I was one of the better, a better player um, at a world championship. Um, and uh, we brought a medal home uh, to our country first in 10 years. So that was good. Pasternak came as well. Um, we talked a little bit during the world championship and, uh, yeah, it was at a point that um, I am not going to call a Boston if they want me back. Um, I was hoping they're going to call back. Um, Pasta talked to me. Uh, Bergeron called me shortly after Sween and, and Cam Neely called me. So um, that was kind of nice that, uh, you know, they wanted me back. And and for me, that was pretty easy decision to to come back. And on top of it, 
um, that year, that last year, we had win a classic, which is always special. Um, I was only 30 games from hit, hitting a thousand games. So everything just kind of worked out, worked out the way it, it was supposed to, I guess. I get the sense you still really, really miss the game. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, but yeah, for sure. That's why maybe I'm I'm uh, kind of staying away from the game. I I obviously do do watch every morning some highlights, but I haven't seen uh, haven't seen too many games on TV to be honest. I'll definitely be watching games uh, in the playoffs, but um, yeah, like you mentioned, um, I was kind of fifty fifty with my retirement. But um, we also have Tori Krug who lives here close to me in the summers, and we're pretty close. And and I skated with him a little bit in the summer, and. Yeah, my hips just gave up again, and and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was just kind of, you know, something was telling me it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's done. It is what it is. So I had to make peace with it, and and uh, I, I miss it, but I'm I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Any chance that if things get better, that you'd give it another chance to play, if not in the NHL, back no. at. The- no, it's done. That was another thing. Uh, we have a world championship coming up next month in. Uh, in Czech Republic, which uh, last time it was 10 years ago or 11 years ago. So uh, I had to miss it. My uh, um, my wife was pregnant with our first, so um, I had to miss that. So I, I really wanted to either NHL, but I, I knew that was just too much. Uh, 82 games plus playoff, that was just too much on my body. And, and I wasn't ready to to start the season anyway. So um, I was hoping maybe around Christmas time or, or January, I can I can hop on uh, for a couple months, play in Czech, get ready for the World Championship. But um you know the the body told me it's um it's not possible and and um so so that kind of made the decision a little bit easier that uh um i just wasn't in any kind of shape to to play on even even in uh back in europe in that league on that level what's the part of the game you miss the most miss the guys that's for sure miss just being on guys every day just uh stupid jokes in the room and and uh Things like that, but then, but then, when you get older, when you when you retire, you you appreciate uh, things like batting, battling for playoffs, getting ready for uh, uh, for some big games, um, the grind sometimes to um, do something that you, you don't want to do in the gym, um, but being around the guys, you know, make 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 the make the most out of the situation you you put in. So definitely, definitely miss that. But um, luckily, I got I still got good friends and uh on the team and and uh different different teams so uh, i think we'll stay, we'll stay pretty good friends for for a long time and and uh, luckily enough uh we i think we bought a house here 2015 and we've been here, we've been here every summer so i know a lot of people um, down here as well so that kind of made the transition a little bit easier let me ask you about some of the legends that you played with big z zidane ochara the guy who wore the c during most of the time that you were playing there I, I, did you? I, I know you haven't been following a lot of hockey outlets, but did you follow the fact that he just ran on the Boston Marathon again for the second time, and he shaved like seven minutes off his best time? Were you following yeah. that? Yeah, and that that is impressive. Uh, he's he's a big guy, but he's uh, he's such a com- competitor, so uh, it doesn't surprise me the things he does. But still, at the same time, man, that's that's just impressive. Um, and I also read he's doing uh, one next week in London, so. Uh, uh-huh. uh, Good for him. I, I feel like people need to find something when you retire. You need to find something that you uh, you get excited about. You you get up every every morning, and there's something to look forward to. I got I got things here, and and uh, looked like he found his passion. So I'm happy for him. But again, that's just um, that's impressive. And one day I'm gonna do one marathon. But uh, he's got seven already. He's got a bunch of different uh, races, and and uh, next week in London. So that's uh, he's just a different animal. That's just. Uh, that's just the way he always was, and I guess he always will be. I had him on the show um, last year, and he was telling me that he really loves to race the high-end bikes, and he actually keeps bikes in different countries. He keeps a bike in France for when he's there. He keeps a bike back home for when he's there. He keeps a bike here in North America. He's got these high-end bikes because he loves biking as well. Had, had you ever played with anybody who was that superhuman on a physical level? That he could do so many things at such an elite level. No, that's just uh, no, that's just him. That's just uh, 
he always had his early on in my career he we had the, the regular bites in the gym just cool down after games or or you know when we work out before games regular bikes but he had his own special little cycling bike and and uh, i know he did some races back uh, back in europe as well years ago uh so he he, he loves uh, cycling uh now he loves marathon so he's he's just um he's just an athlete you know for for how big he is it's it's just it's impressive and and the times he i think it was 3 30 uh yesterday the boston marathon that's uh that's pretty good that's crazy. now mind you, he is six foot nine so he does get a long stride <laughs> he does it's uh helps him a little bit i want to ask you about uh, pasta david Pasternak. one of the the elite scorers in the nhl and he tells a great story of when he when he joined the bruins that obviously he's from he's a Czech as well. So he he talks about the fact that he idolized you as a kid growing up, and he tells this great story. I don't even know if you'll remember this or not, but you had invited him out for dinner to help him relax and feel comfortable, and he said he spent hours making sure his hair was right, everything was good, he was wearing the right clothes, the right he went out and bought the right pair of jeans because he wanted to. And so he did all these hours and hours and hours of prepping for dinner. And he said he showed up and you turned up in flip flops, a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. <laughs> Do you remember, remember that experience at all? I, yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah, that was fun. We just we just went to uh, uh, one of our friends restaurant in, in Boston, in North End. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't meet him uh, a little bit earlier because um, uh, I was getting married that uh, that summer. So I just met him. So he wasn't invited. But uh <laughs> Yeah, we would have a lot of fun if uh, I met him a little bit earlier. What was it like to see Pasta to grow into the kind of player that he has now? And and what was your relationship like with him over the years? Yeah, we just kind of hit it off uh, right at the beginning. And then just our uh, friendship just kind of took off from uh, from day one. And and then just see him uh, becoming the player he is today, it's... Uh, it's just no. I don't think I don't even know if he expected to be the player he is now. But uh, I I know he I know his work ethic. I know whatever he does, he's he's uh, he's such a competitor as well. Uh, but whatever he does, uh, he just wants to win. He just wants to be the best at it. Um, he likes to have his fun. Um, but uh, I I know when there's time to train or there's something, he puts a hundred and ten percent in it, and and he uh, he really is going after what he wants. So uh, it's. It was fun watching him every year. He just got better and better. Um, just when you think he's gonna, he hit the top. No, there's next year he's got he's got another one, and it's just every year he's just getting better and better. It's 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 amazing to watch, and especially this year too. Um, you know, his two sentiments left, and and he's playing with different people, and he's still uh, he's still putting up the the goals, the numbers that that he has so far. So that's um, that just speaks about what kind of. Uh, person and, and player he is i want to ask you about another guy who really polarizes people about how they feel about him you absolutely love him or you absolutely hate him you know who i'm talking about brad marsh <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw this or not but you you know as a player you used to do the nhlpa player poll where you guys get to ask on who you like the best in the league, who the best player is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's always interesting. One thing I thought was very interesting was that the the PA selected Sidney Crosby still today as the best all around player in the NHL. I'll get to Marshawn in a second, but did that surprise you at all? That that even after all, I mean, you you played a ton against Sidney Crosby. Does it surprise you at all that that from a player's perspective, he's still considered the best all around player in the league? Uh, well, the way that the season he's having, no, it doesn't surprise me. I would probably vote for him as well. Um, I play uh, a ton against him, like you said. So it's uh, he's he's just the whole package, and he's got so much respect from around the league. So, um, and he's the guy that. I always want. I always want to watch. It's uh, when there was a Pittsburgh game on TV. I I, I would watch him. Um, so um, it doesn't surprise me. He's. Um, I got to meet him. Uh, I play against him a lot, but I only got to meet him once uh, in, in Toronto in a bubble. Uh, we all stay at the same hotel, so we got to uh, finally. I got to talk to him for a little bit, uh, and he he just seems like a, everybody loves him, and he do 
the little time I spent with him, um, he seemed like a like an awesome guy. So, um, yeah, he's he's just, he's just amazing. It's it's crazy how he handled himself coming into the league, uh, and even we play against each other in junior as well in Canada. So, um, got a lot of history there. But uh, the way he's playing each after year, it's uh, it's amazing. Let's get to Brad Marchand. He gets to see this year with the Boston Bruins. And I don't think, I mean, there might've been some people who are kind of like, really? But as a guy who played with him and, and in the players poll, he was voted the number one player that people hate the most, but would they hate playing against him the most, but would love to have him on their own team. Is that the best way to describe Brad Marchand? Yeah, hundred percent. I would hate playing against him. He's just, uh, He's everything what everyone says, but he's he's so much more when he's on your team. He's he's uh he's he's really amazing guy. He has a great family, uh, great wife. Uh, he's really a family dad, family person. Um, and we share a lot of laugh together. And, and to me, I, it's kind of back to pasta. It's it's uh first he made a team two thousand ten. He was a four liner, and by the time the season ended, he was uh, he scored two goals in uh, in game seven in the Stanley Cup. So. Um, and I told him many times to me, he's been, he's been the best left winger in the game for a long time. So, um, and he's putting up numbers. Uh, he already, uh, passed me in, in, in points and, and everything in, uh, in Boston. So not happy about that, but, uh, I'm very happy for him. And, and, uh, you know, the way he, he's such a professional, so I wouldn't surprise to see him play three, four, five more years. He's, uh, he's, he loves the game. Um, he's got a great family that they su support him in, in, uh, whatever he decides to do. Um, so uh, I hope he plays for a long time and, and uh, I really hope he's gonna, they're gonna make something special uh, this year, the Bruins. And I, I have a lot of friends there, so I'm, I'm cheering for him. Hopefully they'll get it done. You guys won the cup together in, in 11, very nearly um, won the cup in back-to-back -back years because of what happened in 2010 with you guys. Just to remind our audience, in 2010, you're on a great run. You had a phenomenal team. You were actually up three games to nothing against the Flyers. And then an incident with Mike Richards that that dramatically affected you personally and then turned around the entire series, and that was it. Tell our audience about what happened, what your memories were of that moment. I think what happened after I got hurt, uh, it was just coincident. It just, it, it, I don't think it had an impact that uh, I was out. Yeah, the, the the game three, Mike Richards hit me, but I somehow my wrist got uh, jammed and um, it just didn't feel good. I um, to, told the doctors on the bench, it's just something's not right. And then we got the x-ray in the dressing room and it was dislocated my wrist. So um, they tried to put it back in, but at the time, I, I thought if they'll put it back in, I can go play. It, it wasn't the case. Uh, they couldn't put it back in. I had to get a surgery. Um, when you, They told me at the time, when you stop feeling your fingers, uh, you got to get uh, surgery or yeah, there's a chance you can lose them. So that's what kind of happened. And, and they rushed me in the hospital. And um, I was luckily, lucky enough, the, the doctor who was at the game for Philly, um, he was a hand doctor. So I hop in his car. He drove me to Baltimore. I think it was a couple hours from from the rink and um, got a did the surgery right away. So I was I was really grateful he was there and and uh, saved my career. You're very humble about it, but I'll tell you what the the common feeling from all of us who were watching the series was you were healthy. You guys were on a roll. You're up three games to nothing. You had the wrist surgery. You were out. You guys lost the next four straight, and that was it. The end of that run. And people kept wondering, boy, what could have been had you been healthy and it could end up being back to back. Uh, I, I don't know. A lot of us in the industry and a lot of players will look back and go, we'd love to know what could have been as I'm sure you did. Yeah. I feel what? like things happen for a reason. Uh, the next year we come back and then we get them again in, in the second round and we get a job done in four games. So, uh, and then we go on that, uh, on, on the run all the way to the final. So uh, I feel like things happens for a reason. I appreciate the fact you say things happen for, for a reason, and I appreciate your humility, but I'll tell you what, things happen because you are successful in the playoffs. You had 128 points in 160 playoff games. You had good regular seasons, but you always brought it to a completely other level in the playoffs. In the history of the Boston Bruins franchise, one of the most storied franchises in the history of the league, 
Only Ray Bork had more points in the playoffs than you. You're tied with Marchand and Bergeron uh, with 128 points. What was it about the playoffs that brought your game to an entirely different level, not just once, not just twice, but on a regular basis? I don't know. If I knew, I would I would be playing the same way in the regular season, uh, get more points. Just go back and play just the playoffs. It's been done. Kucherov did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I play more in uh, play like that in a regular season, I get I get better contracts, more money. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know i don't know man it's just uh you know in the in the regular season i guess uh it's it's a long season it's it's a grind it's uh it it is what it is uh also you you're trying to kind of establish yourself on the on the team you you don't want to be on on the video the next day if you do something wrong um i guess in the playoff i have i had that little um I don't know if I can say that the word, whatever attitude that I don't care if I mess up. I don't care if I'll be on, on, a, um, on the video the next day. Um, the games, they, they go, they go, you play so many games in uh, right after another. So to me, it's just, I, I just let, left everything out there one game. And I, I don't care what happened. If, if I score goal, if I was minus three, whatever, I knew I have a chance to, to do something again the next game and and uh, i didn't care what uh, what coach uh thought about my game the, before I, I guess i was pretty good at turning the page and moving on to the next one yeah something that, that was really impressive and, and it says a lot about you was you've you've often been quoted as one of the most special awards you ever received it was the seventh player award back in 2009 um uh, it it's for those who don't know it's it's an award handed out by the um the fans, the season ticket holders of the Boston Bruins. And in Boston, it's a big thing because this is, this wasn't just the team, the team or those in the media, but this is the fans. The fans chose you to win that award as a fan favorite. What did that mean to you? Why was that so important to you? It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was big. Also, also um, the player from, um, Last player from Czech Republic who won that was uh, Vladimir Ruzicka, who was a captain for Czech uh, Olympic team in 1998, where we beat Canada in uh, in the semifinals and in the shootout against Gretzky and and uh, and uh, all those guys. And then they end up end up winning against Russia in '98. And I was I was only 12 years old, so that was uh, I remember all the players who play for the Czech national team, and it was such a big. Uh, such a big thing and 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 back home in Czech. And for me as a 12, 12 year old, it's like, this is what I want to be. And yeah, like I said, Ruzicka was co- uh, captain on that, uh, on that Czech national team. And he was the last guy who won the seventh player award uh, from Czech player. So um, that meant a lot to me that I was in, included in the same, um, same category as, as, as him. And, and, you know, people, seven player award is, is uh, people vote that they don't expect uh, that player to have that that good of a season that he had, so that's kind of it's it's amazing right. award, but at the same time, uh, every player expect they got the highest expectations more than anybody else. So um, that was nice to win it. Um, uh, back then, they they give you a car, so I got to uh, keep the car. Um, these days, not anymore. Um, <laughs> there's things uh, I don't really know what they do, but uh, you you can't keep it anymore. Uh, so I was pretty, I was pretty happy about that car. That was my I was on uh, on my entry level contract too. I was making I don't know five hundred thousand uh, dollars before taxes. So uh, that car was very useful. That's for sure. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you go down. You go down in history. One of the all time great Bruins and one of the all time great franchises. Uh, Sixteen years with the team. Thirteen of those years you made it to the playoffs. There's some poor guys, you know, who go a lot longer than that without even making the playoffs once jeff skinner for one poor guy a thousand games and never been in the playoffs yet three times the stanley cup final a stanley cup champion 1032 games the fifth most in boston bruins history 786 points ninth in bruins history what's that mean for you to be a part of boston's bruins franchise history at such a big level because I can't help but think that it's only a matter of time until they, they raise your number to the banners. Raise yeah, your number. there's a lot of lot of players in front of me. Uh, 
but yeah, those are the things that um, it's, uh, I don't really think about it as much. Uh, last year when I was on the team and I was hitting those milestones and um, obviously people brought, brought it up to me. Uh, and that was that was pretty cool to be in the same group as, as some of the other guys, uh, top 10 in, in, a, in a lot of things, like you were saying. Uh, on, on, uh, on a team with a history like Boston Bruins, it's, uh, um, it's amazing. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, it hasn't really sunk in yet, all these kind of achievements yet. Um, maybe because I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not around the game as much as I used to be. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it. Uh, but now we got Marshy and, and Pasta, they're going to pass me. So I, hopefully I'll, I'll stay in, in top 10 in all, all those things because uh, I know those guys are right behind me. Marshy <laughs> Marsh already is way past me. So. You've uh, been super gracious with your time with us this morning, David. It's been great talking to you. I want to play five fast facts with you, okay? I'll ask you five quick questions and you give me the first thing that comes to your mind. You up for it? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Five fast facts with Stanley Cup champion David Krejci. Who was the best teammate you ever played with and why? Uh, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> I have too many good friends. I don't want to... Can, we, can, we, can I, can I uh, get a pass on this one? You can get a pass on. Sure, you can. Okay, who was the best coach you ever played for? <laughs> I'm not going to get you in trouble again. <laughs> you're not I'm saying by saying who your favorite is, you're not saying you don't like the other guys, but you can still pick a favorite. <laughs> yeah, I got two, so I don't want to say. All right, give me two of them. Give me your your, your favorite two coaches you ever played with. Cla Claude and Monty. Fair enough. Fair enough. Who did you hate playing against the most and why? Uh Montreal. Uh, I, I hated them, but I loved it at the same time. Just the rivalry. I, I got into that rivalry early on in my, my first playoff uh, game was uh, against Montreal. We lost game seven. And I just kind of, I, I understood what that rivalry means. And, and I hated it because they beat us. But then I also loved it. It was, it was so much energy and adrenaline. It was amazing. What was your favorite NHL city to play in other than Boston? Uh, Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> and one final question. If you hadn't become an NHL player, what do Soccer you think player. your career choice would have been? Soccer player, 100%. No doubt about it, eh? Were you yeah. any good? I was pretty good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I had a good hips, I would still be, still be pretty good. Well, David, it's obvious you still really, really miss the game. And and I and I certainly get the idea of why you're trying to avoid it and ignore it. But hopefully you'll get back to the point where you feel comfortable with where you're at right now and you can enjoy watching the game you love so much because uh, what you did for the game was amazing. What you did for your um, for the Czechs who may come behind you who one day may look at you as an idol and say, I want to accomplish that has been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm glad you're doing so well. We really appreciate your time, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was, that was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Stanley Cup champion and one of the greatest Boston Bruins of all time, David Krejci. The Overtime Podcast is proudly presented by 7-Eleven and Athletes Care. Before leaving the rink, order your favorite Slurpee, fresh 100% premium Arabica coffee, hot from the oven pizza and wings, pint of ice cream, or even a carton of milk, a dozen eggs, and a loaf of bread from the 7 Now app. And Team 7-Eleven will have your order ready for pickup 24-7. Athletes Care is proud to be celebrating its 25th year, offering sports medicine services to both elite athletes and the general population to require rehab for a new or chronic injury or pain. Go to where the best go, Athletes Care Sports Medicine Clinics with 24 locations in the greater Toronto and Ottawa area. If you missed any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at overtimepodcast.ca where you can both listen and subscribe to future shows. 7-Eleven's Overtime Podcast can be found on Spotify, iTunes Podcast, or any of your favorite podcast platforms as well. Please check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel at O-Time Podcast. Until next week, I'm Gino Reddit saying so long, hockey fans, and thanks for joining us on the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast.